Okay, class. Today we're going to look at slavery before we keep moving on our in, um, in our learning of the U.S. of U.S. history. Now, too often we're going to use that word slavery. Oh, it was slavery, or they owned slaves. They, you know, this and that about slavery. But and when you use a word like that so often, it becomes, you know, almost meaningless. Like you don't really know what it what what is behind that word. Um. And in the sense, then it becomes like, it's almost like uh, in itself, just like slavery was, it becomes dehumanizing. And so um, we need, I want to pause and take a really good look at what we mean by slavery. Now, slavery in the Americas was unlike slavery anywhere else in the world. Yes, there had been slaves throughout the world. Yes, slaves have been, you know, throughout history. But when it comes to slavery as it developed in America, it was a very, very dis different, more brutal system than we have ever seen anywhere in the world. And in it, you see the evolution of race and racism. And so um, we should really look at this system and see, you know, the origins of it and how it evolved into the horrific system it became in the United States. Now, when we look at, you know, slavery, for many people, this was, you know, sadly a business. They saw slaves not as people, but as cargo. And, you know, we have a death rate of around 50%. We know that in the passage here between, you know, Africa and the Americas and the Atlantic Ocean, we lost over 2 million souls. 2 million. And sadly, the reason we have such an accurate number is because they were literally treated as cargo. It's a sad formula of X slaves go in and X slaves land over here. So, you know, the, the, the missing factor, whatever that number is between the two is the rate of loss. But they actually insured them. And this is another thing that these companies were doing you know, to just make a profit out of it. So let's say they lost 50 people along the way. Well, then they would be compensated for those 50 people. So even more so would they care less about throwing them overboard. More so that they would think less about like, you know, oh, we need to really, you know, reduce the weight and stuff like that. So we need to throw something overboard. You know, and, and it's this horrific math that played itself out between Africa and the Americas. Early on, the biggest place that they would disembark was Brazil. There were some other landing points in the Americas, but a lot of times it started in Brazil. There, they're auctioned off to the highest bidder. Then they go through a process known as seasoning. And seasoning is, sadly, I don't know if any of you have ever heard the phrase breaking a horse. But this is where rodeos develop, because horses don't normally let you ride them. Someone has to get on top of them and force them to whipping and holding on to make, to allow them, you know, for them to allow you to ride them. And eventually they become domesticated enough for people to ride them. This is what seasoning was to a slave. They were beaten into submission. Their spirits were broken. They were, you know, and they learned very few words in English, just enough to learn how to do what they need to do. And you can imagine the confusion in all this. While all this is happening, they're lumping all these slaves together from different places. They speak different languages and let alone speak English. And once they were sufficiently broken and taught what they're going to be doing, then they were moved on to wherever they were going to be working. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish set up trade colonies, but then we also see them start to be set up in Virginia by the British, and um, then we have in New Amsterdam by the Dutch, and slowly these, you know, people were brought into what would become the United States of America. And from its roots, we start with slavery. You know, we're looking at 1619 when the first ones arrive. Now, the intention when they first come here is to use native labor. And think about that. Just the very assumption of 
you know, we're going to have labor. The natives will do it for us instead of like, oh, we need to, you know, create this colony on our own and we need to bring farmers and raise every No, no. In their minds, the natives were going to do it for them. But quickly they found out that this wasn't going to happen because one, they died from disease. Two, they knew the world, they knew the terrain, and they knew where they could go, where they had allies, where their other tribes were, where they could escape to. And so this made it really easy to escape. Or they organized, they fought, or they went deeper into the continental United States. Either way, you know, this, you know, they were not the, you know, the, the population that they could use for labor. Not to the extent of what they used African Africans for labor. Now there was a, a, some enslavement of Native Americans who we see it throughout, we, especially in the Southwest. The, you know, the missions, the Spanish mission, missions were built by Native labor, but for the most part, the slavery that we see and we're going to be discussing is the African labor that is brought across the Atlantic through the Middle Passage. Now. Um, there were several reasons, you know, they would use specifically African slaves. A lot of them were already working like sugar plantations and you had to write, you know, um, grow rice and stuff like that. So they kind of already had the skills to do this because they were doing it in Africa. And because of long term exposure to Europeans and um, domesticated animals, because the diseases that the Europeans came, they brought from you know, domesticated animals, you know, cows and pigs and stuff like that, stuff that found in the New World. So when we talk about disease hitting Native Americans, it's because the white people bring it, but also it's because they bring the animals that, you know, were the source of many of these diseases. So they had already been um, exposed to all these things. So they didn't die necessarily from disease like Native Americans did. So, you know, um, th when they come over, you know, they, they are... Um, they may be worked to death, but they're not going to die in huge numbers from disease. So they had a population that they could control and that would not die on them. And then for the longest time, um, they weren't, you know, there was very little escape opportunities for slaves. They were in a strange foreign land. They didn't know anyone around. They didn't know where to run to, to be safe. They didn't know which direction, you know, there was another English or French or whatever settlement. They didn't know any of that. They were completely, they might as well have landed in the moon. They're in a completely different environment and everyone speaks different languages and they don't know who's a friend and who's an ally. And so for, you know, the early, you know, 1600s, you know, to the mid and late 1600s, you know, it, it, the slaves didn't really understand where they could go or what they could do. But slowly this changed. There were many tribes that took in escaped slaves. Um, one, one in particular was the Seminole Nation out of Florida. These, these people would take in runaway slaves. It was one of the many contentions the United States had with um, Spanish-occupied Florida is the fact that the, they, the natives living there would allow escaped slaves to come in and join the tribe. And that's why a lot of Seminoles have a lot of African blood. And they weren't the only ones, but for the large scale, they were the, they were the ones that, you know, took in the biggest numbers. But that was over time that the slaves slowly began to understand the world around them and slowly began to, you know, um, find places that they could run to to escape from in captivity. Now, I mentioned earlier that Slavery in America was very different than slavery anywhere else. Now, other places, your status as a slave still allowed you to do all kinds of stuff, even hold office and serve in the military and, you know, be a teacher, a diplomat. There was all kinds of things. And you could eventually work your way out. It was nothing, you know, a set in stone. Um, and so early on, that's kind of how slavery was tre treated by the by pe people in the Americas, but that slowly evolved out until it became what we call chattel slavery. So we have an example like Anthony Johnson, born in the colonies in the 1620s. He um, eventually obtains his freedom, you know, owns 250 acres of land. We can see documentation that he owned at least one slave and some indentured servants. And so the beginning, you know, this is the concept of slavery that you would have seen anywhere else, and he's a good example of it. Later on, you will actually see more... Um, more instances of slaves that do get freedom um, who actually purchase slaves. And the people they're purchasing are their families. This is how they can gain their freedom by purchasing them. So we see that practice go on, but as 
time moves forward, you know, this disappears all but disappears in the South. In the North, it starts to devolve out. But in the South, it becomes more solidified. And it becomes more and more about race and becomes more and more about denying any kind of rights to African Americans to, in a sense, dehumanize them. Therefore, they could justify maintaining slavery. Now, depending where you lived, I mean, you really, you know, even if you're fine with slavery, you really didn't, you know, um, need as much as other places. So, like, when you're in the New England colonies, this rocky area that didn't have large-scale agriculture, if you owned a slave, maybe it was to help around the house or maybe to help in your place of business, but you weren't going to be owning, like, 100 slaves. <laughs> and if we see tobacco, like, in the Chesapeake Bay and other things, you'll start to see, you know, some being used in the, in, in the agriculture industry. But by large, when you head further south, where you have these large estates, that's where you're going to see, you know, uh, owners owning tons of slaves. And when it comes to that, you start to see also that these guys just see it as part of their wealth. You know, they may like have fifty dollars in the bank, but their net worth is like you know a thousand dollars because of all the slaves they own. So it starts to become part of their income almost. Now in the north, as like more and more industry grows in the north, as far as like you know um, um, converting you know, the draw cotton into something they could ship better. Um, when we start to see more into shipping and bringing in goods from the old world to new world, new world, old world, then, you know, the, the need for slaves disappears in the north. They may, there may have been some, but they just slowly start to disappear. We see abolition of them. So that's why when, when it comes to like, oh, you know, the questions of slavery is they're, they're brought up by different people, especially the abolitionists. You know, they can kind of like, yeah, you know, you're right. And But in a sense, they might just be agreeing because they don't really need them anymore. In the South, they're agreeing because they want them. They need them in their minds as, a, as part of their whole economic institution. Now, a couple of things about slavery you may not know is in 1808, the slave trade is virtually over. You cannot import slaves into the United States anymore. So what does that mean? And why do they do that? Now, does 1808 end slavery? No. You know, Civil War in slavery. Well, technically the 13th Amendment that comes after the Civil War in slavery. What this means is you can't bring any more slaves from Africa. You can certainly have slaves in the United States, but you can't bring them from Africa. And once again, it comes down to simple economics. When you have like a lot of something, the price starts to go down. So in a sense, the United States is producing its own slaves because the slaves are having children. And so, you know, they have an X number of slaves, but as more and more are coming from Africa, the price and value of the slaves starts to drop. So in order to maintain, you know, the, the, the worth of slaves at a certain point, they just can't bring, keep bringing in slaves from Africa and producing slaves in the United States. Incidentally, this is where Texas comes, comes into play. Because Texas isn't part of the United States at the time. And I'm sure you're aware of like all Anglos moving into Texas and settling. And you have people like Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, all that. But most of these guys were coming to Texas because they were slave traders. And since Texas wasn't part of the United States, they were landing slaves in Texas. And then sneaking them into the United States and selling them. So they came here, you know, to trade slaves. And that's kind of why we have a Texas Revolution, because Mexico eventually outlaws slavery and that practice comes to an end. So they would fight a war so they can keep their slaves. Now, as um, like I said, as time progresses in the South, you see it, like this idea of slaves just being used for labor, of slaves just not having, not being allowed any kind of rights, of slaves not being seen as something that should become free because they, you know, they need to be owned. They don't have the right brain capacity. You start to see all these things of race start to be created in the South to justify keeping slavery and what they're doing in the South. And so this is how, you know, race begins to develop in America and how slavery becomes chattel slavery and slavery becomes a brutal thing that, you know, is not seen like in, 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 like in its likes anywhere in the world. Now, most slaves had, you know, the, their owners were quote unquote religious, so they would give them Sundays off sometimes. And when they would do, they'd be forced to go to church. 
And in that church, they would read certain parts of the scriptures that talk about being a good slave to your master and obeying your master. And don't worry, you'll get, you know, you'll get your, you know, your milk and honey when you go to heaven. But for now, you have to be a good slave. Um, and this is basically the world they lived in, what they were hearing all the time. It was forbidden for them to read or write so they could read the rest of the Bible. You know, um, they could not leave their home without a pass, carry a weapon, gather in large groups, own property, legally marry. And this legally marry thing is just in a sense because, you know, they don't want any bonds or unions because at any point in time, your husband or wife could be sold off, your children could be sold off. You know, marriage is something for humans, not for slaves. They couldn't defend themselves against the white person in court, nor could they in general speak in court or sue in court. And all these things literally evolved later into Jim Crow laws. But, you know, and, and when we look at, you know, what kind of lives they had, they still tried to maintain some sense of community within, you know, um, themselves. But it was in no way, you know, a community where there was any type of, like, freedom of expression and stuff. Everything was done in you know, on the quiet, on the down low, everything was done, you know, you know, a lot of the, like, you know, we see the birth of like music, like the blues and stuff, a lot of it was done in hidden covert ways. <laughs> Hence music and other things they could share and stories they could share, but, it, you know, quietly, you know, they never wanted to show how intelligent they were. They never wanted to show, um, that they had any capacity for any of this because that would have been cut down in a second. Now, they did have ways that they would resist. Certainly after a certain point, like I said, once they started to know that there was areas they could go to be free or at least hide from, you know, authorities or from their owners, then we see a lot of runaway slaves. And, we, you know, we see bounties for slaves and, you know, we have slave patrols. Um, and then you had women who refused to have sex, women who refused to produce children, because why? They were just, you know, what like, kind of life are you giving to these children? There was a famous story, um, which later turned into a, a novel, then a movie called Beloved, about a woman, when they come to take her slaves, her children, she murders them. So that, you know, because she didn't, you know, what life are they going to have? Um, they would do other things in resistance, break tools. Um, kill animals that, you know, kill the ox that helps them plow the field. Um, break certain tools so they can't complete jobs. Working slow. You know, if it really takes like a week to put something up, make it take a month. Like what, what, what does it matter to them if it goes up in a week or a month? They're not going to get any better pay or anything. You know, and this gives birth to another negative stereotype that white people put on African-Americans. They're lazy. Oh, they don't do anything. They're lazy. They just want to lay around. But in the sense, that was their former resistance because, like, what am I going to get out of doing this for you? Um, and then in some extreme circumstances, some would poison the food of their masters. Not always to kill them. Sometimes they did kill them. But not always to kill them, but to give them really bad discomfort. Um, one of the most famous people that actually killed using poison was the voodoo queen of New Orleans, Madame Laveau who was said to have poisoned the family she worked for and was said to be able to curse people, um, whether she did this through poison or not. Um, but eventually she developed this reputation of using voodoo to get revenge on her enemies. And, you know, she's a really big deal in New Orleans. There's all kind. Of, there's a thing, you know, to go and, you know, pay respects to her grave. And there's all, you know, there's shrines to her in New Orleans and different parts. But, you know, basically she was a slave who poisoned her family. I mean, the family she worked for. We did see um, large-scale um, slave revolts, the Stoner Revolt, and Gabriel Process Revolt, Denmark Vesey's Report. But probably the most infamous one is Nat Turner. There is a movie a few years ago that came out called Birth of a Nation about him, if you ever want to ch check out a little bit more background on him. But in the gist, Nat Turner became friends with his owner's child. And the mother, you know, didn't want to separate them as her kid likes them. They played together. And as her son grew up and they were, they were, they were attached. So she was giving her son reading lessons and that Turner was allowed to sit in. Now, this was, like I said, illegal, but you know, they, you know, she just let, left it alone. Oh, my son wants to play with him. She likes him around. So, and that Turner learns to read the Bible and he, you know, he becomes very knowledgeable in the Bible. And his owner knows this. And so they kind of use Nat as a preacher. 
to once again re reinforce the teachings of the Bible that talk about being a good slave and obeying your master. And slowly, um, people in the surrounding area heard about this, and they would literally rent out Nat Turner to other plantations. Any times like the slaves are becoming unruly, they would have Nat Turner come talk to them and tell them about the good, you know, the reason why they need to be good. Matt Turner recognized the freedom he had to move around because, you know, he was being rented out here and there. And this actually allowed him to organize a large scale rebellion. By the time that rebellion was over, they had killed over 60 people. They were eventually defeated and captured as a force and then hung in trees for everybody to see. So no one would ever get an idea like Nat Turner had to lead a large scale rebellion. Now, when we look at punishment, um, most often, let's begin with most often, it was done in public with all, you know, they would bring all the slaves to watch, whether it was a whipping, a beating, you know, or if they were being hobbled, like, you know, they tried to escape, so they break their ankle or their knee, sometimes cut off their foot. Um, they were branded, sometimes they were sold away, and they made everyone watch them be separated. Um, and other times when it was something, a lesson that needed to be taught, kind of like Nat Turner, hanging for the trees. You know, sometimes some of the most extreme things is it would be fed alive to wild dogs, you know, to be torn to pieces in front of everyone. But once again, to instill this terror inside the slaves. If you ever think about running away, revolting, like hitting your master, if you ever think of this, this is what's going to happen to you. And in a sense, it's like breaking them again. In a sense, it's trying to break their spirit. But like I said, there was constant ways of revolting. Sometimes it was, you know, covertly breaking tools and stuff like that, breaking, burning a barn or so, so forth. Um, but, you know, but this was a very real thing for slaves. This was a very, this is the environment they lived in, the state of fear. And, and for, you know, the white people that are doing this, you know, they look at them as nothing less than a dog. That's why it's so easy to torture them, to beat them, to, you know, separate them. Because, you know, that is the way that they could exist and justify it for themselves. And this evolved into this super brutal and racist practices that are instilled in the practices and in America's society today. They all have their roots in this horrible, horrible institution. And when we talk about slavery, understand we're talking about separating children. We're talking about torturing people to death. You know, we're, we're talking about looking at people as dollar signs and that's it. You know, we're throwing them overboard as cargo. Don't worry, the insurance will pay for it. You know, when you create that, it creates this horrible, not just, you know, dehumanization of the slaves, but in a sense, dehumanizations of their owners because they're acting, you know, in ways that humans should not act. So when we see the word slavery, understand this is what is behind that word. 